Dead bodies will continue to be transformed into the flesh-eating ghouls. Hello, my name is Spooky Bill, and you are watching episode one of Pathophysiology of the Living Dead. Now, before we get to the real bone and gristle of the series, we're going to have to define death and life. Simple enough, right? Make a diagnosis of persistent vegetative state. Hurry up and die. The shooting was justified because he believed he was saving the lives of unborn children. Okay, so maybe not. Well, luckily, I don't have a political or religious agenda here, so... For death, we will define as the irreversible cessation of oxygenated blood circulation sufficient to maintain cellular growth and metabolism, uh, known as clinical death. This, of course, would happen when the heart rate and respiration stop. Now, I specify that this be irreversible because clinical death can be reversed through CPR or other artificial means. And not to specify this would mean that anybody who has survived is now a zombie. Obviously, this is not the case. So from that definition, we can reverse and say that life is the presence of heart rate and respirations leading to the circulation of oxygenated blood sufficient to maintain cellular growth and metabolism. Now, couldn't I just say life is the presence of heart rate and respiration? I mean, the rest is kind of obvious. No, and here's why. While extremely rare, it is possible for a zombie to have a heart rate, as the heart is a muscle. We got a standard heart rate, respiration, blood pressure. Then we shot him in the chest with the hunting rifle Jack had brought in. He died pretty quick. Painless, too. His vitals zeroed out. We monitored the corpse for a couple of hours, and were about to give up when we caught a heartbeat. Just one, and the cardiograph flatlined. After that, we waited. A minute or so later, we got another beat. After that, the ECG lit up like a nuclear Christmas tree. We'd shot Dr. Mayer in the chest at point-blank range with a out 6 He'd been legally dead for almost four hours, but we were getting brain activity and a heartbeat, albeit a terribly slow one. Respiration remained at zero. Albeit it's a different type of muscle, and we'll discuss that further in a future episode. And now, let's look at the undead groan. While at times it can be just gas escaping through the esophagus, <coughs> but often it appears to be deliberate, especially with speech. The act of taking air into the lungs is also controlled through muscle movement. Gas exchange within the lungs, however, is unlikely to happen, and again, we'll discuss that further in a future episode. So that's it. Life and death defined. This has been episode one of Pathophysiology of the Living. Hold up, hold up, wait a minute. You're not done. Okay, so the problem with defining death is that it leads us to perceive it as an event, when in reality it's a process. Superficially, a recently deceased human bears little difference from its living state. This is because not all the cells in the body die at once. Now, I'm not talking about hair and fingernails growing after death because this is not true. Absolutely, 100% false. False. False! These cells, however, can continue to survive for hours after death, and that's why a severed limb can successfully be reattached after at least six hours longer in colder environments. But cells need oxygenation to survive, and once that blood stops circulating, the tissues become deprived of that oxygen. And this starts a chain of events, leading to increased chemical disorganization, failure of cellular metabolism, and repair mechanisms. That's very important. And ultimately leading to the gross effects of tissue decomposition, which tells us a lot about the zombie pathogen, and we will cover extensively in this video series. Just know that while these cells are technically still living, their hours are numbered, so to speak. Now the problem arises, and this is why it's so important to define life and death, that if the rate of reanimation, and this is the time it takes from a clinically dead person to become a zombie, if that occurs before all the cells of the body have died, is that person really a zombie? Now in most cases, the term living dead is an oxymoron. However, in this case, it seems quite true. Let me know what you think. Comment below. And this concludes episode one of Pathophysiology of Living Dead. As always, questions or comments can be added to the box below, or any other feedback can be sent to me via personal message on YouTube. Remember to keep your eye on the blog. That's potld.blogspot.com. And subscribe to Pathophysiology of the Living Dead. Thank you for watching.